I'm Alice Loxton, and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things royal history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. You've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount for History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details in the video description and use the code REALROYALTY, all one word, when you sign up. Now, on with the show. For 2,000 years, there has been a legend of a warrior king. There's only one way to survive, and that is to conquer! He founded a mighty country, China. He was its first emperor, and his empire became his fortress, protected by a great wall. The legend says he was a tyrant, driven mad by power. Find out who's responsible and have them killed. He cheated death. And built a tomb the like of which mankind has never seen. But it wasn't enough. He wanted to live forever. Where does it come from? Immortality. And if I do not have it, who does? A man with one extraordinary vision. How big is this supposed to be? How big is this going to be? And he left a legacy that has lasted over 2,000 years. Your divine son speaks! Here I am! First Emperor of China! When the first emperor was laid to rest, the legend says he was the most powerful man on Earth. That for 30 years, he'd subjected China to the most violent and bloody phase in its history. Yet achieved the impossible. He unified a people. Ten times as many subjects as the pharaohs of Egypt. Across an empire that would outlast Rome by a thousand years. China was his. When the doors of his tomb were closed for the final time, the most fantastic part of that legend was born. The great ruler, it said, was sealed in a bronze model of his world, at the heart of the largest mausoleum on Earth, surrounded by rivers and seas of flowing mercury. And so the legend remained for over 2,000 years. <laughs> Jeffrey Regal from the University of California wants to separate fact from fiction. He has come to China to examine the latest research on the first emperor. Unlocking the truth behind one of the world's greatest legends. What we knew from these early stories, from these legends, was the tale of a person who seemed from those sources to be larger than life, almost, almost impossibly large as a, as a real figure, as an historical figure. Even though we knew that, of course, he had indeed accomplished the unification of the empire. 
how did he do it? How did it, how did it come about? How, how could such uh, an enormous historical personage exist? Here I am! Oh, heaven! 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 The reality Your of the emperor's life has long been shrouded in mystery. For two millennia, the only detailed information came from a single written history compiled a hundred years after his death. The Shi Ji, the records of the grand historian Su Ma Tian, the foundation of the legend. We see the first emperor from many different perspectives and we're able to sort of recreate the first emperor uh, from the position of his high officials, from those who tried to assassinate him, from the, the kings who fought against him, even the ordinary uh, person in the street. It's an entire world that Sima Tian has recreated for us. But for 2,000 years, all we had was this text. Then in 1974, archaeologists found the terracotta army. It stunned the world. And the greatest archaeological find of the 20th century became the first real physical substance to the legend. Its scale is unprecedented. Terracotta figures were known about from other burial sites, but never on this scale. Never life-size, or in such incredible detail. And never an entire army. If an individual could take with him in death 6,000 figures at first, and then it grew to 7,000, and finally to 8,500. And as of, and, and, and as of the present, uh, present date, it's even larger, and we don't really know how many figures were created. Then we began to see that, yes, there was some truth to these stories. It's kind of like uh, finding the real Camelot except that it is, of course, a, a thousand, ten thousand times more interesting and more detailed and more fascinating. But the huge army is just the beginning. The researchers have so far uncovered over 180 separate pits. And they're still digging. And the more they unearth here, the greater the riches promised by the ultimate prize, the emperor's tomb itself. For 2,000 years, all that could be seen was a vast mound of earth as big as the largest Egyptian pyramids. Now, Professor Jeffrey Regal is hoping that new experimental archeology span will unlock the secrets of the tomb and finally reveal the truth behind the legend of the emperor. For the first time, archaeologists are probing the mound. And Regal hopes to be able to answer centuries-old questions. Is the emperor's tomb actually there? Has it been plundered? And could it, as the legend says, really contain rivers and seas of flowing mercury? And if this turns out to be true, what does that say about the rest of the incredible legend? If someone could be responsible for a burial complex of, of, of that size, of that enormity, then yes, all of this now suddenly rings true. The first emperor shows little sign of greatness the day he becomes king of the western Chinese state of Qin. It's 247 BC, and the omens aren't good. The previous king of Qin has lasted just three years. Majesty, 
The king is dead. Long live the king. King Ying Jian is barely 13 years old. Already the sharks begin to circle, hungry for power. And caught up at their heart is his own mother. My dear boy, I'm so sorry. But the queen has a long-time lover. The last king's advisor, Lu Buei. We are here for you. Majesty, it would be my honor to serve you as prime minister. Let's not talk about this things tonight. But you should confirm Uncle Lu Buei as your prime minister as soon as you can. We all think is for the best. Sleep now. Good night. I shall serve you and guide you as a father. You will get him to do it tomorrow, won't you, my dear? Be patient. And why should we wait? This is our time to rule. All I need is his appointment. Trust me. Good night. Nations like Qin have always been run as a feudal family business by men like Lu Buei. But there is a revolution coming that will change all that. First, here in Qin, and ultimately, the whole of China. The revolution will be led by a young scholar named Li Su. Just months after Ying Jian becomes king, Li Su arrives at his court looking for a job. But the man who hires and fires here is the queen's lover, Lu Buei, now prime minister. Impressed by Li Su's obvious ambition, he is quick to take him onto his staff. It's an impulsive decision he will come to regret. The scholar already has a clear idea of how things work here and how to make his name. I never expected rats in a royal palace, but then, why not? Drawn by the chance of an easy meal, conditioned by fear, control the food and the fear, and you control the rat. Same everywhere. Prime Minister Lu Buei allows Li Su an audience with the young king without taking care to be present himself. We are the strongest state within the seas. By taking advantage of our own strengths and the weaknesses of our enemies. Surely, with the power Qin has at its disposal, it would be possible to completely wipe out the feudal lords uniting the whole world under one rule. This kind of opportunity, sire, only comes once in 10,000 years. Yet destiny rarely ever creates a man great enough to take advantage. But I believe the great ruler is you, Majesty, and the time is now. Li Su awakens in Ying Jian, a realization that real power is his. He just needs the courage and the vision to use it. And over the next decade, 
He will do just that. In the ten years since he came to the throne in 247 BC, King Ying Zhen has strengthened his power through war. He fights for his life and for a dream to forge a new nation, China. Many great kings have tried before him, and all have failed. But this time will be different, because Ying Jian is different. The youngest king to lead his nation into war, he is its greatest warrior. A visionary leader, burning with ambition. If anyone can unify China, it is him. Ancient China is made up of seven warring states. Six of the seven have been weakened by endless warfare, while one continues to grow at their expense, the state of Qin. Well, you've won! In its campaign against the state of Zhao, the Qin army takes over 10,000 prisoners. The rules of war are explicit. Prisoners must be cared for. And the day is yours! And this is yours! However, looking after captives would slow down his campaign. You want to know what to do with it? and Zhao prisoners will be executed. And Ying Jian defines his quest for empire. Bloody, utterly ruthless, and totally dependent on the army. For 2,000 years, no one had any idea what that army was really like. But now, it can be seen, frozen in time. For Jeffrey Regal, this is an opportunity to answer his first great question about the Emperor's meteoric rise to power. Militarily, how did he do it? Joining Regal is Dr. Yuan, who has devoted his entire career to understanding these mysterious figures and the military power of the first emperor. <laughs> To date, they have unearthed over seven and a half thousand individual warriors. In all respects, except living flesh and blood, these were real soldiers. The people who made these figures and arranged uh, and arranged them were following real military procedures. So this really represents what the Qin army looked like. 
This gives us an idea of Qin military formation and the way in which the Qin army was actually put into the field. The big surprise was that the front three lines were highly mobile infantry. It appears these were the emperor's shock troops. Behind them came the heavy infantry, who in turn were supported by columns of chariots. And sweeping up behind, a fast-moving cavalry. But it's not just the precision of the army's formation that has astonished the researchers. It's the weapons they carried. Only the metal parts have survived, but they are the finest quality bronze weapons found anywhere in the world. One of the most incredible finds is a sword, perfectly preserved after 2,000 years in the ground. This, uh, this notch here in the sword shows us that this is a sword that was actually used. This was a, a sword that was wielded by an actual soldier. Professor Yuan has explained to me that this remarkable weapon is longer than any sword that existed before the Qin, started, the Qin dynasty started to make these, uh, uh, significantly longer. Qin armorers managed to perfect the art of bronze making to give their soldiers 30% extra reach and cutting power in close quarter combat. And there is new evidence that shows quite how seriously the Qin took their ability to wage war. Oh, a Qin halberd, uh, part of the bronze assembly at the top of the halberd. The sharpened bronze head was placed on the end of a 10-foot long staff, making a powerful weapon. This has an inscription. What it says is that in the fifth year of uh, the King of Qin's reign, the Prime Minister of State, Liu Bu Wei, had this halberd made. That's a guarantee of its quality and that it was made to a standard so that he himself was being held accountable for the effectiveness of the weapons that the soldiers were carrying into battle. The well-trained, highly motivated Qin army, equipped with precision weapons and led from the front by a ruthlessly ambitious king, creates the perfect conquest machine. Within seven years, Ying Jian captures 13 cities from the state of Han, a further 20 cities from other states, and repels a combined force intent on stopping him in his tracks. But while foreign enemies are easily brushed aside, inside his own court, unseen enemies want to destroy him. The official history records Ying Jian's coming of age at 20 years old as the defining moment. The entire court is assembled in celebration. But not everyone's watching the show. The queen has a new favorite. Marquis Lao Ai. In the eyes of the court, Lao Ai is a eunuch, which is an odd choice of companion for a woman with a history of important lovers. But Lao Ai is no eunuch. He has fathered two sons by the queen, who they have raised in secret. And he intends to place one of them on the throne. But the king has his suspicions about his mother and her supposedly secret lover.
The state of Qin is not a safe place for anybody. The queen has kept her young son secret in the care of eunuchs she believes are loyal to her. But loyalties change quickly, and the king has learned of their existence. Hello. Hi. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Knowing it's only a matter of time before his plot to put the eldest boy on the throne is discovered, the queen's lover, Marquis Lao Ai, makes a desperate bid for power. He has stolen royal seals, giving him the authority to mobilize troops. So you think you'll make a good king? Yes. The boys have just condemned themselves. As a direct threat to the king. <laughs> District forces under Lao Ai's command approach the palace. He knows his only chance is to catch the king unprepared, with the palace lightly guarded, and seize the throne. Palace security is the responsibility of the prime minister Lu Bue, and he has just discovered Lao Ai's plan to grab power. What is it? The royal seals are missing, Majesty. The ones used by military commanders. I strongly recommend that we put all palace and regional forces on high alert. Really? Lao Hai has disappeared. It seems he may have taken the seals. If he is able to mobilize troops, the state could be at risk. Why would he do that? Why would a marquis threaten us? What could he hope to achieve? I don't know, Majesty. What would a eunuch do with a throne? Even if he had it, who on earth would he leave it to? Eunuchs don't have successors, do they, Lu Bui? Except, of course, this one does. Two pretenders to the throne, courtesy of my mother. Some eunuch. Now, if you don't mind, I think we have a rebellion to crush. Lao Ai's forces meet no resistance as they approach the palace. But a trap is being set, and they advance straight into it. Lao Ai's troops are annihilated, and he is taken prisoner. He said he did it for you. You've executed him. No, not yet. But I think you should come and say goodbye to. Armors, Mr. Lau, before we take care of him. I'm not going to let my boys say that. 
Of course not, Mama. Just you. The boys, they can stay. Come, Mama. About Lao Ai. About Lao Ai, your boy. I'm not the first queen to take a lover. You've done more than that, Mama. Lao Ai's execution is designed to send a very clear and deliberate message. Soon to be reinforced by killing every single member of his family. Starting with the most dangerous. I knew you see them as a threat. They are not. Not now. The first challenge to Ying Jian's reign is over, and the lesson has been learned. Ruthless control becomes the standard treatment for all, including his own family. His mother has conspired against him, and her sons have paid the price. Now, Ying Jian is expected to add his prime minister and his own mother to his long list of victims. Lu Bue is under sentence of death for failing to protect his king. But they have a special secret bond. Looking for forgiveness, Lu Bue? Yes, for your mother. But perhaps you should have thought a bit more carefully about who she slept with. Then you would not be here. 
How dare you speak to me like that? As any father would dare speak to his son. To tell him the truth. I can forgive her. Can you forgive us? I can. And we'll do what is right for the king of Chen. If I choose to show mercy, then it is only the judgment of a ruler. Nothing more. The prime minister is exiled from the king his son, and the king's mother. Both parents' lives are spared. But within the year, Lu Bue will commit suicide, a disgraced and broken man. Waiting in the wings, his own protege, the scholar Li Su. He will be the new power behind the throne perfecting a totalitarian ideology ready to impose on a unified China. By 227 BC, the Qin state has swallowed three of the independent states of China, like a silkworm devouring a leaf. Panic spreads ahead of the advancing war machine. The state of Yen is next in the firing line, and they know they will be powerless to resist. A diplomatic mission is sent to the Qin court. Its aim, to halt the advancing bandwagon in its tracks. They bring peace offerings to King Ying Jian. The first is a map of Qin's conquests, guaranteed to flatter the king. The other gift is the severed head of a renegade Qin general returned as a sign that Yen will not harbor Qin's enemies. But the men carrying them are no diplomats. They are professional assassins, and neither expects to return from the mission alive. The plan is for one assassin to distract Ying Jen by showing him the head while the second gets close enough to strike at his heart with a dagger. Bring it out. The first assassin keeps his nerve. But his accomplice is frozen with fear. Bring me his gift and let him wait outside. He's going to have to act alone. Since Lao Ai's attempted coup, Ying Jian's greatest fear is betrayal and assassination. Now, no one in court is armed except him. And no one except him can summon troops.
Ying Jen's new security system has failed. The Great Conqueror, the Invincible King, was inches from death. And he knows it. Where are you? Where? A bunch of hellish chickens? Farmers? From now on, paranoia grows in Ying Jen's mind. For the rest of his reign, images of death haunt his dreams. It isn't so much the act of dying he fears, but the realization that he is filling the spirit world with the souls of those he sacrificed. Souls who will all, as soon as he is dead, seek terrible revenge. There is only one thing that can protect him in the next world. A spirit army. Since the moment he became king, Ying Jian has planned for his own death. A tomb is being constructed, which by tradition will contain replicas of his most precious possessions, including his army. Hmm, good. That tradition will continue. Very good. But on a scale no one has ever seen before. How big is this supposed to be? Well, it's a simple question. How big is this supposed to be? One of the most incredible aspects of the Terracotta Army is size. Not just the army itself, but every single soldier. Each figure measures six feet tall, an army of giants by the standards of the time. Chinese kings were known to bury miniature terracotta soldiers as spirit guards for the afterlife. Never a full-sized army with state-of-the-art weapons. He felt that in death, that the spirits of his enemies might actually attempt to attack him, and so he needed a spirit army. These clay soldiers who would, whose, whose very substance would last forever, he would need them in order to protect him from these, from these spiritual enemies that he'd had before. But it seems even the Terracotta army was not enough. Closer to the emperor's tomb mound, a new pit has been discovered. A research team under Dr. Duan Qingbo were expecting to find an imperial palace guard. But all they have unearthed are empty suits of armor made of stone and no sign of any terracotta warriors to wear them. Regal believes the evidence points to an emperor more and more obsessed with death and betrayal. Hey, When we look at uh, Chinese historical texts, it's unprecedented that uh, we would find or know about stone armor. And in fact, uh, the belief of Mr. Duan and his team and, and, and their colleagues is that the burial of this stone armor may have had something to do with the rituals surrounding worship of the spirits of dead soldiers who suffered violent deaths, whose, whose bodies then could not, uh, were, were torn apart could not uh, uh, undergo the, the proper kinds of burial ritual. They didn't have, in the Chinese definition of things, a happy death. So something had to be done for them, because otherwise they might become vengeful spirits. They might turn against the first emperor himself. So here, in this pit, something is being provided for them. Uh, uh, take a bow. 
Duan's team has so far found over 200 sets of stone armor in this one small pit. But this excavation is just the corner of a pit as big as the Terracotta Army itself. Tens of thousands of stone armor suits were made ready for the spirits of dismembered soldiers. By 223 BC, Ying Zhen stands on the brink of achieving his ultimate dream, the unification of all of China. He's taken all but two of the seven warring states, with the largest state of Chu, the last great prize to be claimed. But the conquest machine has stalled. The Chu army has destroyed his first invasion force, and they're more than ready to do it again. Now, half a million Chu soldiers threaten to end Ying Zhen's dream of empire. In a desperate bid to overcome them, he commits everything he has. New provisions, better weapons, and half a million more men. The Qin army appears to have dug in for a long siege of the state of Chu. Two vast forces of equal size face each other, and the fate of China hangs in the balance. What will ultimately tip that balance in favor of Qin can be seen in the remains of the Terracotta army itself. One of the greatest finds is a perfect replica of a Qin war chariot. On its front, a model of one of the deadliest weapons ever created, a Qin crossbow, the assault rifle of the third century BC. No functioning originals exist, but weapons expert Mike Lodes has had one recreated from the Chinese model. It's a mighty weapon, tremendous power. The power comes from the bow. This is a composite structure made of horn and sinew, and that gives a really powerful spring. The real key to this is the trigger mechanism, the secret to how the whole thing works. It's incredibly ingenious. So what we've got here is a weapon that will give us range, a weapon that will deliver energy, deliver power, deliver thump into the enemy. Sufficient power to drive a crossbow bolt straight through flesh and bone. to 23 BC, and the Qin army appears to be an immovable obstacle, dug in for a long siege of the state of Chu. It prompts the Chu generals to reconsider their advanced position, and they decide to withdraw to more defendable lines. But what looks like the static Qin encampment is in fact an illusion. The entire force is primed and ready to move immediately. The moment their opponent's backs are turned.
the last great obstacle to Ying Jen's imperial dream is finally crushed. The sole remaining independent state of Qi succumbs without a fight. By 221 BC, the ultimate prize is won. Qin is now China, his China. At the age of 34, Ying Jen is crowned with a veil of stars, symbolizing the divinity of China's first emperor. Now his ministers are ready to suggest a title suitable for the greatest ruler in China's history. Your Majesty, of old, there were the celestial sovereign, the terrestrial sovereign, and the great. Am I not the first great sovereign emperor, august ruler of the whole of China? Or am I missing something? Majesty, your vision humbles and inspires us. It shall be so. And my son will be the second divine emperor, and his son the third, and so on, on to 10,000 generations. Your Majesty. He called himself Qin Shi Huang Di. Literally translated, this means he was the first august god of the Qin. He regarded himself not only as a deified figure, but as an initiator, a creator, someone who was beginning a long lineage. And so, with the help of his chief minister, Li Si, the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, put in place a system of governance that would long outlast him. Li Su, who arrived as a young scholar the year the emperor came to the throne, has now become the new power behind it. For 20 years, he's perfected a system which will sweep away China's feudalist past once and for all. But not everyone is ready for the revolution. The most illustrious divine august emperor. The feudal lords are destroyed. May we recommend that the sons of the imperial household be established as the new feudal lords. Everyone expects that with unification, the feudal order will continue, with power and privilege taken from the emperor's enemies and given to his family and friends. May it please His Majesty to give his consent? But they are in for a shock. Li Su. Only Li Su has correctly read the new political climate because he created it. This is insane. We have spent centuries enduring endless warfare at the hands of the feudal lords. And now that we finally put them down, we want to create more of the same? But these will be members of the imperial household. Exactly. The only force in a thousand years that has been able to create peace is the divine power of the emperor. There must be no loyalty but to the emperor. And his divine power must be executed in the most efficient way possible through officers who have no other interest except to fulfill his divine order. 
Without this, the chaos and warfare will return, which, of course, we do not want. Excellent. He is right. The Minister for Justice is right. I shall personally appoint six governors for the six commanderies of the empire, 36 in all, which of course is six times the number of the states I have conquered. Ah, did I mention six is my favorite number? <laughs> Li Su's totalitarian philosophy is called legalism. And there is evidence that shows how total the power of that new regime became. Rule Sturks has been deciphering a series of legal documents from the tomb of a minor official in the distant reaches of the new empire. The text sets down rules that governed every part of every citizen's daily life and the penalties for transgression. If you look at the punishing system in the Qin legal system, then physical punishments that include mutilation, tattooing, for example, tattooing the body, tattooing the face, cutting off parts of the limbs, these were traditionally one uh, among the most severest punishments. For example, there's, there's one provision here that says if you have two people, Texas, you know, fornicate, then they ought to be sent off to the market, which is a polite way of saying that they will be beheaded on the market square. So even private life here is part of uh, sort of the tentacles of Qin, of Qin law, now to be universally applied to everybody who was a subject you know, of this new world order called the Qin Empire. In 220 BC, Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi sets off to survey his new empire. For the first time ever, a secure and peaceful land. And he intends to keep it that way. Millions of deconscripted soldiers are now freed from fighting, ready to be reused. The empire is won, but it must be secured with a great wall. For centuries, the northern edges of civilized China have been ravaged by nomadic tribes. And though the frontier towns have had defensive walls, there were always plenty of gaps. Now, that will change. With the major wars over, labor is plentiful, and building begins on the greatest engineering project of the ancient world, a single impregnable barrier to seal the empire, the Great Wall of China. Made of compacted earth, it is 30 feet high and 3,000 miles long. At its peak of production, the records say, over a million people are enslaved to build the Great Wall. Perhaps a quarter will die in the process.
The Emperor's demands on labor keep on growing. With the Empire secure, he turns his eyes to the fulfillment of his next great vision, sending thousands more workers to build a tomb, befitting the first divine ruler of all of China. Today, all that can be seen is a vast earthen mound as big as the great Egyptian pyramid at Giza. The first clue to its possible contents was the terracotta army. But that was nearly a mile from the tomb mound. When archaeologists dug into the space in between, an incredible world opened up. To date, they have found over 180 separate pits, containing so much more than soldiers. Hundreds of terracotta dancers, musicians, and acrobats were built to the same exacting standards as the emperor's precious army. And the imperial craftsmen, freed from making weapons, created perfect birds to stand in the artificial lakes of buried gardens. And perhaps the most exquisite bronze artifact ever found a half-scale model of the imperial chariot to convey the emperor in his underground world. The burial mound, it turns out, is in fact at the center of an enormous necropolis, an above-ground and underground city for the, for the first emperor. It, it, it would provide him, it would continue to provide him with all of the trappings of power, with all of the protection that someone of, 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 of his status required. But there was no way to see the ultimate symbol of power, the tomb itself. Yet again, it was the ancient official history that provided the only clue. But this time, the account seemed too incredible to take at face value. The emperor sent more than 700,000 convicts to dig down uh, through three rivers and fill it with bronze. On the floor of the vault, there was created a map of his entire empire, all of China. He had artisans uh, stick jewels into the ceiling to represent the sky, the cosmos above. The streams, the ocean, the text said, were filled with quicksilver, with liquid mercury. He had some kind of machine which circulated that mercury to imitate the actual flowing of the waters that it would be a kind of water clock, a machine, and that as long as it kept running, the emperor would continue to exist in his enclosed world. A bronze tomb filled with liquid mercury. The idea seems beyond fantasy. The weight of the mercury alone would be more than 500 tons. Even though China has mercury ore in abundance, how could one man command such resources? And could it be proved? The tomb of the first emperor of China has been sealed for over 2,000 years. But there is a way in. Using a new combination of techniques, including ground-penetrating radar, electrical resistance measurements, and core samples. The research team under Duan Qingbo have been able to build up a three-dimensional model of the entire complex. Beginning with the outer walls of the necropolis.
and revealing for the first time the mausoleum structure hidden beneath the mound. An early surprise was that the mausoleum appears as a vast divided pyramid, with passages leading to the tomb from the east and west. And when they took the all-important readings from the ground underneath the pyramid, they discovered the tomb itself. Seen here as a clearly defined area marked in blue, an underground space hermetically sealed for over 2,000 years. It measures as big as a football field. And though at first the pyramid appeared to be a solid closed structure covering over the tomb, the outer surface of the tomb's roof is in fact open to the sky. Or it would be if it hadn't been covered by a million tons of earth 2,000 years ago. Duan and his team have been probing that earth for almost a decade, tracing the shape of the pyramid beneath their feet with a series of 4,000 core samples. And each one, Jeffrey Regal realized, could potentially hold an incredible piece of evidence direct from the tomb itself. Because if there was mercury there, over the centuries, mercury vapor could seep through the roof and into the surrounding soil, where Regal hopes they may be able to detect it. Samples of this sort enable us to see the, uh, the, the, the supporting structure, the rammed earth structure that's supporting the entire mound. But of course, what really interests us is what is the burial like. So if the legend about the emperor having placed in the base of his tomb a map of all of China, uh, of all of his empire with rivers of flowing mercury, if that legend is true, then we can expect that a test of this soil will tell us whether or not it's true, will either provide us with corroboration or won't. The Chinese archaeologists have no immediate plans to excavate the tomb. They have no way yet to preserve its contents and no desire to disturb the emperor's spirit. So for the foreseeable future, the mercury test may be their only way to understand what's inside. Each of the 4,000 soil samples from the tomb mound has to be individually analyzed for mercury content. That process has been ongoing and is almost complete. By 215 BC, the tomb itself is well on the way to completion. But the man it is intended to house suddenly has a change of heart. No. No. The idea of an eternal afterlife, however grand, is no longer enough. I will live on. I will live on. In 215 BC, the first emperor of China is once again on the road. He no longer trusts the security of his own court and has started taking practical steps to extend his life. His doctors prescribe repeat doses of something long believed to increase longevity, sex with multiple partners. But his new court physician, Zhu Fu, has suggested something more chemical, a substance 
whose eternal properties are thought ideal for the emperor's tomb. Properties, Zufu hopes, will keep him out of that tomb indefinitely, if consumed. The mystical substance, mercury. Have you got it? Yes, Majesty. Will it work? Majesty, all the world's alchemists agree that mercury is highly indicative of increased longevity. How increased? Sire, as with sex, given the right application, it can help. A lot. How much longer one can expect to live is not guaranteed. And what is? Where does it come from, Zufu? Immortality. Where can it be found? Why do I, the first divine sovereign emperor of the whole of China, not have it? And if I do not have it, who does? Sire, there is a legend of a place where the immortals live. A series of islands called Pang Lai, where we believe the immortals reside forever. There are two types of elixir, one to restrain the flight of the Hangzhou upon death. Find the... them. Majesty? You will go there, find them, and bring them back to me. And then you will personally administer them to me. Majesty. But the uh, whereabouts of the islands are unknown, and I have no means to get there, even if I knew where to go. Give him whatever he needs. Yes, Majesty. This is an imperial mission, and my missions do not fail. No, Majesty. Do you believe me? Yes, Majesty. Go. Zhu Fu is given a small army of his own with which to conquer death. Thousands of young men and women are conscripted to help him search for the islands of Peng Lai. The emperor takes his first course of mercury pills. If Zhu Fu is right, it might help hold back the years until the elixirs can be found. But rulers rarely die of natural causes. Accident or attempted assassination, history doesn't record. But the real cause of the fire in the imperial encampment makes little difference. For the emperor, there are always enemies unseen enemies, enemies within. He starts to withdraw further into his own world, giving greater power to those close to the throne. By 213 BC, Li Su, now promoted to prime minister, has been left free to expand his totalitarian state beyond the mundane rules of life. He decides it is now necessary to control thought. 
free thought is to be suppressed, starting with an act of terrible destruction. Entire libraries of bamboo scrolls are burned. Only a single copy of each agricultural and medical text is kept, secure in the Imperial Archive. Everything else is destroyed. There are worse shocks to come. Those who try to hide their works are rounded up in their thousands, branded on the face, and sentenced to a life of forced labor, mostly on the Great Wall. And those who resist further are buried alive. And all the time, the Emperor's contact with reality is being loosened still further, aided by his mercury consumption. The dose has been increased over the last five years, as his desire for immortality has become more obsessive and the elixirs of the islands of the immortals have failed to materialize. But far from prolonging his life, the Mercury's actually having the opposite effect. Take it away. Liquid mercury was known to Chinese alchemists as the only substance that could dissolve the eternal incorruptible metal, gold. To the ancient mind, it must have seemed like a supernatural substance. There was nothing like it. I and mean, the natural inclination is to think it has some power that maybe if you took it into your body, then, then it would pass this magical property onto you and even perhaps help you prolong your life. But not in its liquid form. Pure mercury cannot be absorbed by the human body. So the Chinese alchemists made soluble compounds they knew were easily digestible. And this, it is believed, is what the emperor took for years. The more he took it, in whatever form he was taking it, the more dangerous it was going to become. As more and more mercury is absorbed into the body, then it begins to attack the nervous system. So slowly, you'll get a slight tremor, and that will get worse and worse. But the damage that's really being done to your body is in the brain. Begin with, you become talkative. Uh, later on, you become slightly aggressive. People became very confrontational. They were obsessed with being watched. But eventually, of course, it becomes total paranoia. This is from Gangju. Directly from Gangju. Well, how do they know where I am? Well? Anyone revealing the Emperor's whereabouts is under instant sentence of death. Find out who's responsible and have them killed. Seven years after Qin Shi Huangdi began his quest for immortality, the mercury is starting to poison his body as well as his mind. Among other things, his kidneys are beginning to fail. He knows his time is running out, and there is only one place left to turn to save himself.
Here I am! Oh, heaven! Your divine son speaks! You see? The world is united at last! I erase doubt, establish law. I punish disorder and bring calm to the four corners of the earth. And now, all under the sun and the stars are of one mind. Mine! All guided by one single will. Mine! And one day... I shall be God! I shall be God! Thirty five years after he came to the throne, Qin Shi Huang Di embarks on yet another imperial tour. But this one is different. Where once there was a prosperous and powerful nation, today the nation rots. The land is starved of labor for the emperor's great projects. Famine looms. And there's nothing anyone can do. The Emperor's obsession with immortality is uppermost in his mind. The legalist system takes orders only from the top. And while the Emperor was rational, Li Su was ready to implement his vision with ruthless efficiency. But now the vision is turning to madness. I have a fallen star. The Emperor's latest diversion is a meteorite, which fell to Earth in a distant province. To Qin Shi Huang Di, it is a sign that his call to the heavens has been answered. Do you know what it means? No, Majesty. This is a divine message. There will be no after Qin Shi Huang Di. Majesty? You don't suppose that I'm just gonna die? Of course not. We are searching for the elixirs of Peng La. Su Fu failed, didn't you know that? Never came back. I sent the spies to find them, and do you know what they said to me? They couldn't find the island because their way was blocked by a race of giant fish. Majesty, we will move heaven and earth all right. Li Su, I had a dream about a sea god in human form. Me. I am the sea god. I've ordered the armorers to build me a giant crossbow so I can hunt the fish. How big do you suppose they are? In the sea. Yes, that's where they live. <sighs> Forward, soldiers. The historical records say the emperor reached the island of Jifu on the coast of China 
in the 10th month of 210 BC. Where he hunted giant fish with a crossbow. That's right. The great realist is now immune to reality. All right, let me down here. The divine okay. ruler, warrior king of the Qin, has gone. Give me the crossbow. In his place, a madman whose every whim ha! must be accommodated. I'm here! Coming for you! Ah! I am the first sovereign emperor of the whole of China! Emperor Chen Zhuangdi! And now I command you to let my people pass! Over there! Lizu! Over there! East! East! Steady! While the emperor plays in a world of his own, his advisors plan what to do with his empire. Once his poisoned body has gone the way of his poisoned mind. Whoa! Yo! Two! Two! It's up! They know it won't be long. With Li Su is the emperor's second son, Hu Hai. Hu Hai is not the emperor's first choice to succeed him. But the emperor will not live forever. And Li Su has plans to change the succession. Returning from the coast, Qin Shi Huangdi becomes ill and hurries back to his capital. He writes to his eldest son, Fu Su, telling him he is to succeed as the second emperor. But the imperial convoy is stopped in its tracks. In the seventh month of 210 BC, the journey is over. The search for immortality has ended. Majesty. Majesty. The great empire has lost its maker. At the age of 50, Qin Shi Huangdi is dead. The state is rudderless. And this is exactly the moment Li Su and his supporters have been waiting for. He decides to keep the death secret to give himself time to put his plan into action. They know the letter to his son was written, but they don't know if it was ever sent. Their luck is in. The letter is still there.
they now have the power to change the imperial succession. And it will bring the empire to its knees. Following his death in 210 BC, the body of the first emperor is taken back to the giant mausoleum that was built in his lifetime. And after Qin Shi Huangdi, the most powerful man on earth, has been laid to rest, the last few precious objects are ready to place beside him in the depths of his vast tomb. But while the formal rites proceed according to the emperor's wishes, outside in the imperial city, a power struggle is underway. From a recently opened pit close to the emperor's tomb comes startling new evidence to suggest that the imperial family was tearing itself apart. Professor Yuan thinks that the death of this individual is very much linked with the struggle for succession after the death of the first emperor. What is remarkable is that there's an arrowhead embedded in the base of the skull, here, behind the ear. It looks as if this is a person who was shot at close range. That means, of course, that this was no accident. This was a, an assassination. By tradition, the successor should have been the first emperor's oldest son. But several members at the court conspired to have a more junior member of the family succeed to the throne. After the junior member became the second emperor, he then saw to it that those who had opposed him, his brothers, his sisters, more distant relatives who were all members of the Qin imperial house, all of them were then killed. the emperor is ready for his final journey. And he will not go alone. While his chosen successors are being assassinated, hundreds of his favorite concubines prepare to make their final act of devotion. They will stay with their master to start a new imperial family in the next world. But while the terracotta soldiers stand guard over their emperor, outside, real soldiers are fighting real battles. Rebellion stirs. And there is evidence that graphically shows how far that rebellion spread right into the compound surrounding the emperor's tomb. The stone armor reserved for the emperor's dead soldiers shows clear scorch marks from an intense fire that swept through the burial pits. The terracotta army itself was in pieces when it was discovered, smashed by rioters. The one area the rebels will never reach is inside the tomb. This is the emperor's final resting place and he must never be disturbed.
it has long been decided that not only will he take his concubines and his terracotta army, but the designers, the architects, the engineers, and builders of the tomb, all those who know the way in and out will be forced to stay. Hundreds are sealed inside the tomb, and all its secrets will stay secret. All except one, the legend of the rivers and seas of Mercury. and soil samples taken from the tomb mound of the first emperor have been tested and checked at Beijing University for traces of mercury. Now Jeffrey Regal is about to see what could be the greatest revelation since the discovery of the terracotta army. He's come to meet Dr. Liu, who's been processing the samples. And the results are ready. The first piece of news is that there is mercury there in huge concentrations. And it's not just found anywhere. Each red dot is a core sample, each blue one where mercury is found, and the dark blue show the highest concentrations. And all of it within the actual tomb just as the ancient historian said, laid out in the shape of his empire. Oh, well, this is, this is an extremely interesting map. This concentration here corresponds to Bohai, the sea that we know the first emperor visited in his search for immortality. This concentration in the south and southwest would correspond to the great marshlands, the great wetlands of the southwest and the Yangtze River. It's just startling, in fact, that one would find, uh, confirmed so neatly, one would find such a striking and exact correspondence between scientific evidence and ancient legend. So, yes, indeed, just as described 2,000 years ago, when the first emperor had his underground palace created, he did indeed have a map of his empire. He did indeed have all of the rivers and seas represented, and those rivers and seas flowed quicksilver, liquid mercury, forever. Qin Shi Huangdi left a legacy, the like of which has never been seen before or since. A nation unified for the first time with a single written language that is still being used. A system of administration that survives to this day. And a great wall that still stands at the edge of his realm. But more than anything, Qin Shi Huangdi created the idea of China, a people and a land as one. Perhaps his desire for immortality was realized after all. <laughs> <laughs> 